was publicly shot in Moscow in full view of the Kremlin. He was a young, path-breaking provincial governor who many saw as a symbol of Russia's future in the heady days following the Soviet collapse. Boris he was a reformist off. deputy prime minister and, in the eyes of many at the time, a potential president. He was an uncompromising opposition leader who refused to be co-opted by Vladimir Putin's authoritarian regime and who persevered in his opposition even when it appeared that nobody was listening. And five years ago, on February 27, 2015, Boris Yefimovich Nemtsov became a martyr. And in many ways, Boris Nemtsov represents the path not taken in Russia. But what is his legacy? And did his hopes for his country die with him on that fateful, chilly February night half a decade ago? Hello from SEPA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and welcome to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. And joining me here in the studio is former U.S. State Department official and veteran Kremlin watcher Donald Jensen, a senior fellow and editor-in-chief here at SEPA and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. Hi, guys. Welcome, Great to Don. Be back. Hi. Also with us here in the studio is Ilya Zaslavsky, the head of research at the Free Russia Foundation. Welcome back to the podcast, Ilya. Glad to have you here. Hello. And I, I have to mention, like, we're all Almost to the minute of five years from the assassination yes, of Nemtsov. Right, yeah. It was about, as we're recording here on February 27th, it is 3.30-ish p.m. here in D.C., which makes it 11.30-ish p.m. in Moscow. Nemtsov was assassinated at 11.31 And let, let me just interject here. We all three knew him. We all three knew we him. We still mourn his loss. And we still, we miss him. Um, um, so we've been living in a world without Buddy Snamsoff for five years now. It's kind of hard to believe. And uh, those of us that knew him, as Don said, and I think we sp- speak for all three of us, we miss his commitment. We miss his integrity. We miss his determination. And of course, we also mit- miss his wit and humor. He was a very funny guy, not to mention we miss his very colorful use of the Russian language. I learned ways to speak Russian that I <laughs> I never would have learned in school from Buddy I, I have just we miss his leader. <laughs> Yeah. And we miss his leadership, yeah. yeah. Um, earlier this month, the Czech capital Prague renamed a square and was formalized today in front of the Russian Nem- embassy after Boris Nemtsov. In doing so, Prague joined Kiev, Vilnius, and our town of Washington in this effort to honor the slain Russian opposition leader as part of an initiative, I should say, of our good friend, all of our good friend, Vladimir Karamorza, and uh, kudos for him to him for that. We, sh- we should also note there is still not a street named after Nemtsov in Russia. And efforts by his supporters to erect makeshift makeshift memorials have met with vandalism and official repression. In St. Petersburg this week, authorities denied requests for a memorial march in St. Petersburg. So let's start really broad here. Um, What was Nemtsov's legacy in Russia? Does he have a legacy in Russia? I mean, I see it as the path not taken. Um, and that up could apply to anybody. But Ilya, you you probably knew him the best of us. What what, what is Nemtsov's legacy today in Russia? Um, there is a, a lot of legacy, actually. Uh, his opponents obviously try to ruin it and say there is none. But uh, really, amb- among uh, above all other things, he's seen by many more people beyond Russian opposition as a decent character, as a as a person who was least divisive and Mm -hmm. uniting people and many opposition leaders uh, after his death, immediately at his funeral, uh, uh, said to each other that we should stop be, uh, you know, divided. Mm-hmm. His his death should really uh, uh, be a landmark in our activity. And um, apart from uh, from that overall feeling, which I think is now actually quite widespread in, uh, in big cities and among mm-hmm. Russian intelligentsia, I think uh, there are very specific legacies uh, left. Uh, by Boris Nemtsov. Uh, there is a Boris Nemtsov Foundation in mm-hmm. Germany and uh, his daughter, his Jean daughter is, is Jean running is it, in Prague, training yeah. new journalists and uh, bringing together various um, uh, leaders and opinion makers uh, to Germany. Uh, there is um, uh, Magnitsky Law, mm-hmm. uh, something that uh, together with uh, Vladimir Karmoza, Boris lobbied Nemtsov for. lobbied for. <laughs> Uh, and out of that, Global Magnitsky Act uh, grew and various other initiatives in U.S. Congress to deal with uh, Kremlin. 
And uh, there is something that uh, uh, we at Free Russia Foundation, together with Vladimir Komorza, are doing now, writing reports that Boris Nemtsov wanted, mm -hmm. finishing some of his work, like um, um, Russia's uh, war against Chechnya, Russia's uh, hybrid activities mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, on sanctions and so forth. That's, I mean, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because one of these things Nemtsov was doing was putting out these reports regularly. Putin Itogi, uh, yes, yes, uh, Lushkov Itogi. And right before he, shortly before he was assassinated, he put out a report on, on, on Russian activity in, in, in Eastern Ukraine and military activity, yeah. which the authorities were not terribly um, So we're all happy. hearing on that work then, in a way. Yeah, yeah I mean, his work. And another thing I would add is that for me, Nemtsov separates the Russian people from from the regime. I mean, when I say Nemtsov is the path not taken. And I think uh, our friend Vladimir Kadramorza plays on this very cleverly because his campaign to create these Nemtsov squares or Nemtsov streets or Nemtsov alley or Nemtsov lane always across the street from the Russian uh, embassy. And when the Russian embassy complains about this, the, the the answer, and Vladimir, when I joke about this, it, it's obvious like, whoa, do you feel guilty about something? Do you have a problem with Washington or Vilnius or Kiev or Prague honoring a great Russian? Is, is there a problem with this? And there really isn't an answer to that because if they object to it, they're admitting guilt. And this allows opponents of the regime to honor a great Russian and making the, the not so subtle point that this regime does not really represent the Russian people. Don, anything to add? Yes. To uh, really just codas to what both of you gentlemen are saying. His legacy, yes, I agree. We ca all carry on his work, but Brian used the word decency, and I think mm -hmm. every society, including our own, has some unhealthy elements, but I would say Russia is plagued probably by more than most, and that uh, the sense of decency that he brought gave an air of freshness of hope, even in a system about which I'm not particularly optimistic. And I guess I would add, Brian, to your issue of the your point about the road not taken. I will sound naive, and I'm certainly not about Russia, is the road not taken yet. There is hope that mm -hmm. perhaps it will change in the future. Although so, I am, quite frankly, I'm very knows me, I am not optimistic about that. But let's just say yet to... <laughs> Uh, for those listeners who think we're always too too much focusing on the negative, and I think with good reason, but you know, perhaps the, the other thing about Nemtsov is he was uh, he was very human. I mean, to, yeah. to, when you well, get to know, I mean, yes. I remember the first time I met him, I was so intimidated, and I was put at ease immediately because the guy was so damn informal, yeah. cursed like a sailor. <laughs> I mean, and, I mean, he was cocky, and but that was also part of what made him so so human and so approachable. Um, I looked back today, just kind of reminiscing and preparing for this program at my initial reaction to this. And I looked at the, the, the daily vertical video I put out back at my previous employer, RFERL, about this. And I, 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 the video started by saying, we've all seen this movie before and the ending always sucks, right? And I talked about the assassination of Vlad, Vlad Listev, which was supposed to yeah. change everything yeah. and it changed nothing. The assassination of Galina Stravoitova in 1998, which was supposed to change everything and it changed nothing, the assassination of Anna Politkovskaya, which was supposed to change everything, and in fact, it changed nothing. Was Nemtsov any different? Was any, because each of these assassinations were this line that, that could never be crossed. I mean, Listia was the first big one, and it was really shocking at the time, back in, in, in 95. Starovoitova, for me, was a big one, because I knew, she was, this was the per first person I knew personally who, 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 was, who was assassinated, and I was actually interrogated by the FSB. Um, as a as a witness in that one, um, was Nemtsov crossing a line? I mean, people raised at the time it kind of did because he was a former first deputy prime minister and he was a top tier opposition figure, and this was a line even Putin didn't want crossed, and that we can get into that in in, in a bit. But what, what what do you guys think? Was a was a line? Was this a watershed moment? Was something? Did something change forever at that point? I think it was it was a watershed, and um, I strongly personally believe that it's a signal that Vladimir Putin himself wants to send to the world and to Russian opposition. I uh, I mean we will get to yeah. who is responsible and everything, half, but yeah. for one thing, there is no doubt that uh, Putin is now uh, fully aware of all details uh, of this assassination, right. but he's not revealing them. He's right. involved in cover up. I mean uh, I also believe that he, he's the one who ultimately. Uh, 
ordered and benefited from this assassination, but that's debatable. Yeah. But that he kn- by now knows all the details and, and is not revealing them, that's a big message. Um, it, it also, just today, uh, Putin gave uh, uh, an award to Senator uh, Suleiman Girimiev, who right. is uncle of uh, one of the main uh, figures implicated, uh, yes. Ruslan Girimiev, right. who was never properly Who's interrogated, never, never interrogated uh, right. or you know investigated. And they are both clo- close to Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, who and, also uh, received an award uh, right after the assassination. He received so many medals, he has to grow a new chest. Uh, but yes, <laughs> but, but uh, you said a Russian uh, government is not responding. You know, to, it is responding in those covert ways. Uh, which are also brazen and uh, uh, completely indecent, uh, giving awards to these probable mm. participants, but also refusing to uh, any inves- proper investigations from uh, from OSCE, from uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, but also like uh, uh, you know being petty um, to uh, lawyers of the uh, Nimtsov family, mm. like. Um, uh, Vadim Prokhorov, uh, right. who is friend of Clara Morza and right. Jean and so can tell you all about it, and he has written about this in the press and in his blogs. But basically, you know, like pretending, like the, the, some of the uh, one thing which really uh, shook me, uh, he sent uh, some inquiries to Council of Federation, mm-hmm. and the Russian officials pretended that they don't know the address of the Council of Federation. Really? And so forth, yes. <laughs> We've so, seen this movie before, you yes. would say. Right. So yeah. that sends a message where, where what they really think about this uh, investigation. Well, you know, and what you raise, I mean, I, I, this is one area where I do think this, this did kind of cross a line in that killing somebody as high profile as, as Nemtsov was, the way I... Uh, like kind of couched at the time was I called it the hybrid great terror because remember this was this was 2015 everybody was talking about hybrid war the war in Ukraine was was is still raging but at that at that time was still relatively fresh um, and I said this is a hybrid great terror this is not little green men it's it's it's, it's men jumping out of a little white car um, because they that's where they they assassinated from a white car on uh, in, in in Moscow and I said this is a, a plausible deniability death squads with plausible deniability and this always existed but to kill somebody of Nemtsov's stature said nobody nobody but nobody is 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 safe from this don anything uh, uh, yes, you would add on uh, this uh, i do think it's different a- and i have been one of those I, people i think a minority who both as you did knew some of the other departed friends you mm. mentioned but i but I, I do think we should be careful of, of lumping all of them to sit this together in the same way you want to get into what happened in the system later but i would say that you cross the line here because boris was a political figure yeah and the others were starvoito was a political starvoito uh, yes but not like this and and i think this crossed a line where putin has now ha- began targeting the opposition in a much more aggressive aggressive way the others were listed i was there in Moscow, yep, I remember same. very clearly, investigative reporters, you know, and that kind of thing. I don't want to minimize the hor- horrificness of that. But you talk about, a, you know, you, you're offing a guy, as I used to say, who was many a people thought man. would be a future president of Russia. Yeah, he was that's once considered big, to be, and this is one difference. place I do want to go with yeah, that. that's a big because, difference. Because Nemtsov was once considered a future president of Russia. When, yeah, he was yeah. the, when he was the governor of Nizhny Novgorod, I remember in 96, a lot of Russian liberals wanted him to run against Yeltsin. And then in 98, when he became first deputy prime minister, 97, 98, he, Yeltsin himself was 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 ready to anoint. Now, and Yeltsin I had, had this had anointed, debate with a friend of ours, Floriana Fasato, about yes. 1998, who she said he would be president of Russia. And I thought at the time when I was still in my did. very optimistic phase, yeah. I thought he he had a very real, and he was genuinely really, really popular. And he was um, always the one we cited when I was in the government about the reformer in Nizhny Novgorod, I believe it was, yes. in the late 90s. He was always different willing to be more flexible, a little more innovative, and you know, that that's very important. Now, but one has to wonder, I mean, Don, you and I were both in Moscow at that time, and could you imagine a world in which he did? In other words, was this truly the path not taken? Can you imagine a world in which that did happen? Um, by 98, 99, it clearly was not happening. 
right? Yeah. The regime was moving in a different direction. Well, I was cynical pretty early, I have regret to say, uh, earlier, but that was confirmation, along with a number of other things, the Chechen war and how it was right. put down and the more nationalist line and so forth. Well, you'd have to go back to 96, 97, when, when he and Chubais were made first deputy prime yeah, ministers. Yes. And I was always much more optimistic about Nemtsov than I was about Chubais. Um, but <laughs> Good for you. Got, you know, that, that's not, I mean, that's not a terrible no, hard no, to no. do Many people for were, anybody were, that was in or Russia are still. at that time, right? And, and their behavior after Putin came to power actually speaks volumes about the two of them, where Chubais quickly found his nice warm place in the regime, as did Kirienko and other so-called reformers of the Yeltsin era, where Nemtsov chose the street. If he had wanted to, he could have let himself be co-opted. Yes. He'd probably yes. have a sweet job yes. right now as yes. head of Ross Adam or Ross Nano or some some you know state corporation where he could siphon a lot of money. He chose the street. And I thought that spoke volumes about him. Yeah. Really go ahead. Nemtsov showed his true colors and true nature when he actually, uh, even under Yeltsin, he brought one million signatures against war in Chechnya, yes. Yeltsin. Yes. No one among other so-called lib uh, systemic liberals di did anything remotely like that. Uh, so he could never be part of the system. I think that's actually one of the reasons Yeltsin himself didn't want, uh, yeah. didn't, no longer considered him, you know, uh, a possible successor. Well, yeah, because as deputy prime minister, first deputy prime minister, he was going, he was going after Gazprom. Um, and that was against, and this gets, I mean, I'm not, we're never going to have a podcast where I don't say the word Sistema, and I'm going to say it right now. He was, he was cutting against Sistema. I mean, he was kind of trying to bridge that gap between being part of Sistema and being like somebody who's kind of like trying to reform it and change it. Um, but I agree with you, Ilya. I think that did make him unacceptable to the powers that be at, 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 at the time. Gazprom, the Yeltsin family, Berezovsky, the oligarchs. Because if you remember correctly, in the very early days, it was Berezovsky, who brought him in, who recommended to Yeltsin that he bring him in as a first deputy prime minister. And I remember the kind of cynical feeling among kind of Kremlin watchers in Moscow at the time, like, ah, oh, so Nemtsov is basically going to be Berezovsky's guy. But then once he was in power, he didn't act like Berezovsky's guy. Control. There were all these signals that he was not really of the system. Don, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll put, make a point that I have to put very carefully. One of the shortcomings, which is our fault, not his, because he's a hero in my view, is that we thought in, in the West there were many more people like him. Yeah. And the idea that, and that's that's our problem, it's my problem, it's your problem, that's not his problem, yeah. because he was a decent, honorable guy. We thought there were, we thought Chubais was like that. He was, uh, he disappointed. Uh. Trust me, there were many, there were many who there did. Were many. We thought a lot of people, you mentioned some of them already, who were going to be like buddies, and they weren't. And so, he reminds us what Russian leaders can be. I mean, yeah, and he of reminds whole... us of our own misperceptions and mistakes at the time when we didn't understand fully what was going on. I mean, of that crop of of, of elite, of the, the, so Kirienko at the time I had hopes for, but they're gone now. <laughs> uh, Chubais I, and Gaidar, I lost hope in very very quickly. Vladimir Ishkov was one who oh, actually yeah, yeah. I at the t who I think, and he like Nem like Nemso, he didn't go into full throated opposition like Nemso, but he went into opposition. There's a Another guy who clearly would have been a great face for this regime to have, to have this Western leaning kind of public Potemkin face that you can go ahead. He's still around, but um, um, he's not as charismatic. He uh, yeah. was never as charismatic and, uh, you know, seen as, uh, sk as skillful and, and uh, um, decent as, as um, Nemtsov, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. But this is what I wanted to do, this little thought experiment, and it is kind of, it's speculative and it's supposition upon supposition, but if we could rewind to say 1997, let's say things went a little differently. And let's say Yeltsin backed up Nemtsov in his, 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 his attempts to rein in Gazprom. Let's say the reforms took hold in the, the 1998 crisis in Russia, maybe happened but wasn't as severe as it was and didn't discredit the liberals. And let's say Nemtsov did get on a trajectory to being Yeltsin's successor by like 99, 2000. Would he, do you, how do you think that would have played out? Because there's a lot of uh, material out there. I, I, re I read an article not long ago 
by Vladimir Milov, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, arguing that, you know, even Boris might have been kind of caught up in this sistema himself. And it would have kind of, he, he, he would have not look at, looked like such a heroic figure right now because he would have had to make the compromises that you have to make in power. Ilya, what do you think of that? You've been closer to all this than any of us. I think to be, in a nutshell, he would have been eaten alive mm-hmm. by you these various so? factions. So? Yes, because so? well, who was there? There were communists with Zyuganov, uh, there was uh, Lushkov and Primakov with his uh, KGB and kind of may- mayoral apparatus. Urban oligarchy. Uh, yeah, urban yeah. oligarchy. Yeah. And Berezovsky. There was, uh, Berezovsky. <laughs> yeah. And then there was Putin, Berezovsky, and uh, uh, really, we, we should call them, you know, gangster group from St. Petersburg. Right. KGB gangster group from St. Petersburg. Already very well developed. I estimate that Putin by then had several hundred million dollars mm-hmm. for, between him and his buddies. So... Um, if he came to power, uh, if Nemtsov came to power somehow, he would have to uh, not only deal with those uh, different factions, uh, but uh, build some some sort of viable uh, liberal opposition. Yes. And, uh, sorry, coalition. And at that time, I, I, in a nutshell, I think Russia was bound to bounce back to some sort of mm. post-communist KGB uh, system to for people to really understand that the reforms haven't been finished and democracy hasn't been built. Yeah, I mean, if I want to think out, and this is really a stretch, but I mean, there were potential allies even in this yeah, like, carnival. Could of, he have built a coalition? Of, well, I would, I mean, a logical ally for him would have been Hudakovsky then. Because if you remember, and I remember interviewing Hudakovsky uh, shortly as Putin was coming to power, it was March of 2000. And Hodorkovsky said the game's changing. He's like, and this actually coincides with what I'm trying to do because I do know it's time to reform this company and make it act more like a Western. I was skeptical at the time. I didn't believe Hodorkovsky as far as I could throw him. But but he said it, and and he, and, and the, he went ahead and started doing it, reforming Yukos, making it more accountable to its shareholders, paying his taxes, which you know, I, I mean, you've got the the minimum thing you want a responsible corporate citizen to be doing. Um, now imagine it was President Yemsov and not President Hodorkovsky at that time and you would have seen if he if he brought Hudorkovsky in that was you know that was the he was the richest man in Russia at the time he would have had an Avin and Friedman could have been potential allies in the oligarchic circles so yeah he still would have had to deal with Berezovsky he still would have, would have had to deal with the Lushkov Primakov mafia and the the, the the still fledgling Putin mafia in Petersburg you look skeptical Ilya though you don't uh, see just it. on so many fronts firstly uh, 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 exec- executive branch was already penetrated by KGB officers, uh, uh, even by uh, last years of Yeltsin. Uh, Nemtsov would have to get rid of all of them. I'm not sure how he could have done that. Uh, uh, figures like Avin was always close to Putin. He mm. actually shielded him from criminal investigation in 1992 when, when in government. Um, none of these people were true liberals uh, at the time. Um, I would argue none of the oligarchs even considered. They were playing some games right. in parliament, but they were not really ready for a proper you know, right. separation of powers and uh, right. accountability. So uh, he would have been outflanked, even if he somehow got into this presidential position. No, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I'm just trying to, as a, just by way of a thought experiment, because I did introduce him as the path not taken. But what we seem to be saying is that path was blocked anyway. And it makes me wonder, and Don, this is where we get into our existential yeah, I want to get optimism or pessimism I here. I mean, I, mean, I am temporarily thing. pessimistic about Russia, and I am not sure if I'm existentially optimistic, right? I mean, when you when I talk about Ukraine or Georgia or other former Soviet republics, I I am usually temporarily pessimistic and existentially optimistic. Yeah. Un- who, un- who, about uh, Ukraine, about Georgia, but about Russia, I am definitely temporarily pessimistic and I think I am existentially pessimistic too. Don, go. Who am I to defer with Ilya on his own country, <laughs> but I would say not inevitable, but highly likely, mm-hmm. first of all. For me, there were four points of possible departure. Uh, number one was the 93 elections, mm-hmm. which might probably were falsified. Mm-hmm. Could have gone in another way, not necessarily a pleasant one for the West. Number two is the long forgotten General Lebet, mm-hmm. who I, about as charismatic a guy as you could possibly imagine, 
Number three would be Boris Nemtsov. And then fourth, I think, would be the primakov luskov thing happening, any of which were not probable to happen, but maybe could have, and none of them did, for the reasons both of you And the primakov luskov thing was basically the same as the Putin thing. But, I mean, I think it's something... But, but really- it was more reform... On paper, who knows what would have happened? It's, it's, but it was a different. It was a challenge to Vlast in a way that is not how the system works works now so far. I mean, there is something we have to remember from that time, and it's like we our memories are always very, very, very selective. Um, Putin emerged as the Yeltsin successor as a compromise. I mean, there were the hardliners and the Suleviki faction wanted Libid. Chubais and the so-called liberals wanted Stepashin effectively. And Putin was seen as this compromise. And at the time, there were like jokes like, oh, Putin, uh, Yeltsin fired his 40 something because they were all in their 40s at the time, his 40 something, you know, ex security chief from Petersburg for another 40 something ex security chief from Petersburg. Now, Stepashin yeah. was a lot more liberal than Putin, like quite frankly, but There's at the time fire. they looked similar. But if you remember Nemtsov at the time, and I believe the but Isifimovich regretted this to his dying day, is he did write an op-ed on the eve of the Russian elections in the, in the New York Times saying Russia could do a lot worse than Putin. I mean, he was holding out hope because Putin, there were, I mean, Putin worked for Subcheck. There was a lot of liberals that wanted to see. And I, 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 by that time, I was pretty cynical about Putin. There was a time in my time in Petersburg, I saw Putin as a potentially positive force. I never saw him as a potential president, um, but he fought on the right side of things. Usually in St. Petersburg, he was usually fighting on the more liberal side of things, at least publicly. But if we remember, I mean, I remember this very clearly, this op-ed that that Boris wrote in the New York Times uh, right as Putin was coming to power. I remember challenging him about it at a, at a reception at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow on election night in 2000. Edward Lucas, our colleague Edward Lucas and I both came over to, to Nemtsov and said, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? And he, I remember he looked at me and said, what can I do? You know, what can I do? What can I do? And I said, oh, I don't know. Yavlinsky's like, it's not realistic. So he was, I mean, he was pragmatic, but he was clearly uncomfortable with it. And I think after that, I think he regretted that because that did give a veneer of legitimacy to Putin that I think, but he's probably regretted afterwards. Don, any thoughts on that? Just that I think that our, our original sin in the West was to misunderstand what happened in August 91 and what broke up the Soviet Union. It was not a victory of democracy or Democrats. It was a victory of upper middle nomenclatura yeah. greedy oligarchs usually, we've talked about this before yeah. on here but once you start to talking about democracy or not it becomes in Russia's case it becomes very difficult without yeah. stretching meanings of what you mean to and, understand and I would also say that uh, many so, so called systemic liberals who, who came out to be systemic liberals under Putin, they they were selling the idea of Putin at the time, yeah, and yeah. turning blind eye on some of the few investigations or revelations that came uh, about. Like uh, there was uh, uh, journalist Ivanidze who published yeah. some of the stuff uh, yeah. from Marina Salia dossier from yes. Petersburg, but no one. Wa- it was in Nova Gazette in two thousand, like or even uh, late nineteen ninety nine. But no one wanted to oh, take it seriously. If you could get your hands on the local Saint Petersburg press from the nineties, when the Subchak administration was in power, you will find so many corruption. Now I am curious because this stuff is not digitalized because this would be pre pre internet age, and but I would love to know if thou those archives still exist and I would love because there was a a day didn't go by where there wasn't something about some kind of corruption involving Putin in Petersburg at that time. I think because he wasn't Putin yet. He was not untouchable yet. Exactly. There was a dual problem. First, almost everyone was tired of Yeltsin's rule. I'm pretty sure Nemtsov himself was tired. Everyone wanted someone new. Everyone thought that it could go into (laughs) flames. thought he was on death's door. It it could go into (laughs) flames in much worse way. That's what on yeah. the one hand. And on the other hand, here's this supposedly Sobchak's guy right. who has acted liberal uh, in some ways and who has brought some people who, who had the veneer of decency around. Actually, Chubais was selling, uh, you know, uh, yeah. idea of Putin to everyone as well by that time. By Although Chubais really wanted Stepashin. Uh, but was, when that was not possible, he was going around and saying, oh, this is Sobchak's guy. This is yeah. our guy. Um, I mean, I remember, I mean, that conversation he and uh, Nemtsov and I had 
at the U.S. Embassy. I mean, he said, God, he's going to close down NTV. I got it on good information. He's going to close down NTV. And I was like, buddies, and you still, he's like, no, still you good deal. You know, he was like, he, you could f- sense his frustration. I don't blame him for it. I don't have to live in that, 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 that system. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live, you know, to, to be here. Um, but, uh, but, but it's, I, I am sure he regretted that. I never talked to him about it after. We had many conversations over the years after. I never talked to him if he truly regretted it. Um, I can I, I can tell you that he definitely regretted it because uh, Ilya Yashin told me uh, yeah. that, uh, that they discussed this with mm-hmm. uh, Nemtsov and he, he did. He, he also showed he uh, Nemtsov quickly realized w- what Putin was up to and was, you know, um, suggesting different ways to act about this mm-hmm. in Parliament while, while liberals were still present there. But there was even a divide on Putin. Uh, uh, within SPS, within yeah, uh, I know. R- uh, liberal the party, private seal, yeah. and it essentially was destroyed and uh, uh, f- uh, fell apart. Prim- a, a lot to do with those uh, divisions over yeah. Putin. Well, when when when, you, when Putin moved on Moscow uh, on Moscow and NTV very quickly. And I remember Nemtsov giving a speech on Pushkin Square, on top of a soapbox, basically saying the the new the new authorities' first contact with with the society has been violent. I remember that was his opening line, and he almost looked like he was in tears. And I remember, you know, it was literally weeks after we had kind of discussed this article in the New York Times that he the, that he had written. But Don, anything to add here before we you're move depressing to the new... me, both of you? No, I, I know. I, I want to do? say was, that was... <laughs> none of this was inevitable. It was merely highly. Lied. Likely, and I wish we had realized that at the time, mm-hmm. instead of these childish, simplistic char- uh, characterizations labels that yeah. meant very little in the Russian context. Uh, forgive me, my friend, the uh, <laughs> systemic liberal. Now, you think about it, it's sort of a joke. I mean, you no, know, I would just remove the, the liberal from that and just yes. systemic. Exactly. <laughs> systemic I'm saying something. it uh, ironically. Ironical. Like, I, know I, you are. I, I know almost you are. hate I know these guys are. more than KGB guys because and, yeah, this KGB is really, guys tell us what This the, what is still are. one of right. the, I think, un, unplowed fields, which is that I don't think there's been really enough work on the 90s. No, I think anyway, we were, there, oh, there's a lot of work to do in the 90s. to um, the Putin succession, and it's not as all as the Kremlin portrayed. It was a much more complicated thing. Yeah. And one could pick out from the from the kasha or whatever you thought would be beneficial to your point of view. Yeah, no, certainly. But I will say, uh, Boris Nemtsov was never a systemic never, liberal. Never, never, he was a never, liberal. Never, never. Um, yes. He was a liberal. And in this, again, this showed, if you look at those two, the the energetic young reformers, Chubais and Nemtsov, remember that's how they were branded. Well, look what they both did under Putin. Chubais found his nice, soft, warm, cozy spot and very monetizable spot. <laughs> and, and even and, now you hear of And sure, Nemtsov went to the street. Even now and, you hear of Alvin and, lost and, Fried, Alvin and Friedman asking the reform oligarchs. What? Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't get me started on that. Let's not get. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's not, we won't get you started on that. Actually, that's a what? That's a that's a good uh, that's a good segue into our second half. In a few moments, we will continue our discussion and look at the investigation into Nemtsov killing five years on i'd like to remind you you are listening to the power vertical podcast my name is brian whitmore director of the russia program here at sepa joining me here in the studio is former u.s state department official and veteran kremlin watcher donald jensen a senior fellow and editor-in-chief here at sepa and a lecturer at johns hopkins university also with us in the studio is Ilya zaslavsky the head of research at the free russia foundation i'd also like to remind you you could subscribe to the power vertical podcast on itunes you could read the power vertical blog and watch the vertical video at sepa Dot org, and you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. So in June 2017, a Russian court sentenced former Chechen battalion leader Zaur Dadaev to 20 years in prison for killing Nemtsov. Four other Chechens were found guilty of involvement in the killing and sentenced to prison terms ranging from 11 to 19 years. But the Russian authorities notably never went after those who ordered the hit, leading to widespread suspicion that it came from the very top of the Kremlin elite. There's widespread belief backed up, I must say, by the preponderance of circumstantial evidence, the Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov was in fact behind Yemsov's assassination, and there is a lot of debate over whether Kadyrov was just going rogue or whether he was acting with Putin's blessing. And just for the record, I believe this is an open question. 
Um, I agree. Go back to that time. It was pretty weird. Putin, remember Putin disappearing from for public weeks. for two weeks? Uh, what's also not noted is Kadyrov disappeared for several days within that period as well. I mean, they were they were having a little Rasborka. And at the time, according to my information, the FSB wanted or f- elements within the FSB did, in fact, want to go after Kadyrov. They thought this was a chance to bring this guy down and they wanted and that he had crossed a line and that he, you know, let's face it, assassinated somebody in Moscow without getting our permission <laughs> because they, they're the ones that are supposed yeah, to decide well, who gets to whack who, when, where and how. And um, implicitly, Brian, given your the comment about the Putin two backed weeks, him up. Putin backed him up, but Putin may not have known. We just don't know. We don't know. I, I don't have we an don't answer. Know. Not, we don't for those know. of you listening, I don't know one way or None the other. None of us know. It's and a, I've, heard accounts, circumstantial I've heard evidence. accounts, second, third hand, that Putin's reaction when he heard of this, like, who dared do this? You know, yeah. and then, yeah. then he found out who it was who dared do And then suddenly that guy gets a medal. So what does that tell you, right? Now, this week, a report by the OSCE's par- OSCE Parliamentary Assembly spe- Special Rapporteur, uh, Margareta Cederfeld, said shortcomings in Russia's original investigation left many questions. Questions unanswered and called for quote yeah do you think a new and full investigation I'm not holding my breath for this to happen Ilya your thoughts going forward what can civil society I mean can you have civil society journalistic outfits like Bellingcat which have done remarkable work uncovering things that the Russian state would prefer to keep hidden is there hope because I'm not placing any hope in the Russian authorities under this regime to get to the bottom of this uh, what, are you, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on this so, so yes you're right the Russian authorities already uh, through Dmitry Peskov said that uh, there will be no international uh, investigation on Russian soil so that's a quick response to you from Russian authorities but um, obviously Obviously, family of Boris Nemtsov and all opposition forces are, uh, have been investigating everything that they can through their own means, and they should continue to do so. They have already, I mean, uh, they can't get into the footage from uh, the uh, from Kremlin from from the night uh, around Kremlin at the time, uh, which has been you know blocked by FSB. But right. uh, they can obviously sh- show different uh, ways how uh, Russian authorities are covering up yeah. the investigation, and that's telling in itself. Um, they should pursue. Uh, this for years. Everyone should understand that this is going to be a, a game for many years to come. Yeah. That uh, this will go beyond Putin's uh, lifetime and that uh, eventually uh, things that are somehow held in Russian archives or in, uh, you know, different clans, uh, that we will pursue them and we will want, you know, mm. this is not going away for eternity. Uh, but. Um, uh, it's frustrating to have to throw it on the MH17 pile <laughs> of unsolved but cases. But we got to the bottom of MH17. Yeah, we we pushing, know without a shadow of a doubt what happened. And a lot of thanks goes to investigative Bellingcat. journalists and Bellingcat, Bellingcat for, 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 investigative for getting journalists. that. And here is uh, what um, um, I want to say personally. Oh, oh, I, I believe that, uh, as you said, no one knows for sure, but I think all the indirect evidence shows that actually it was uh, uh, beneficial um, to Putin himself, not to Ramzan Kadyrov, who didn't really have that much beef to do to, b- between him and Nimtsov. Mm. Uh, eh, Putin, there were some. Uh, yes, but <laughs> not, not more than with some other position figures or uh, nothing that deserves, you know, um, such a um, um, brazen attack in front uh, be, uh, near Kremlin. Right. Um, uh, Putin has a track record of eliminating his um, anyone who can compromise or uh, compromise him or challenge him politically. It's it, there is a book by Emmy Knights, you know, order order to kill. Mm-hmm. Um, Putin, uh, there are characters uh, well known uh, like Litvinenko, Skripal, you know. Uh, oh, I will but, not doubt that. I but, mean, and but, actually, Politkovsky. But then there are uh, many other killings that happened in Saint Petersburg. Um, many many of them were kind of quiet, though. I true, mean, the people true. all. All the people, because Putin, uh, working in Petersburg in the 90s, I know Putin spent a lot of time with gangsters. He spent a lot of time with unsavory characters, right? Every single one of them 
that I can think of right now that who knows where the bodies are buried, so to speak, regarding Putin. Anybody that had any serious compromat on Putin is dead exactly. or in prison. In the case, in the in the case, in the case of, of Kumadin, the Tambovska leader, he or, 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 or Kumadin, in prison. Yeah, yeah. Um, but any, but it was all kind of quiet. You know, it wasn't these high profile center of Moscow assassinations. Um, so I, I mean, I. In a lot of ways, it doesn't matter if Putin ordered this or not. His reaction after the fact and letting Kadyrov, not only just letting Kadyrov go. I mean, I'm not sure if Kadyrov got a stern talking to. He got a medal in public. I remember that. Um, but what happens here is Kadyrov functions as this kind of death squad with plausible deniability. It's very advantageous for Putin. Was like, hey, I can't control this crazy Chechen dude, right? And that works because the result is the same. If Chech if, if Kadyrov thinks that you're that Putin doesn't like you, then you <laughs> you're fair game. And if Putin's not gonna do anything about it, what's the difference if he ordered it or not? Um Don, any thoughts on it? Well I want to ask a series of questions. Go. Taking the again, I don't know, guys, my friends, I don't know. But let's say there's another explanation, which is that, for example, a Putin henchman did it the Henry the Second variant, right? And then Putin said, oh, went along with it in the end and did what he did with Kadyrov, uh, and this gets uh, to me even more interesting with with the Skripal poisonings. Mm. Raising the question, well, I think those were ordered by the crowd. I don't think there's any yeah, doubt in my mind about those. Yeah, but does there are all all these killers in the bureaucracy? Are they? To what extent are they acting on their own or not? And I don't have a good answer. I'm just raising the issue. Uh, is Putin in control of all these? Gangsters, you called them, and I think correctly. I think yes, generally he is, but I'm not 100 percent sure of it. It's generally, I think I want to repeat, he is, in my opinion, largely responsible or mm. orders it. But we're, but the fact that we're not completely sure raises some interesting questions. Uh, second is um, or third, I lost count, mm. is uh, the, those two weeks in February. Mm-hmm. March. That was the, that was the most extremely surreal interesting period in Russia. The fact I that Putin, if the surprise theorists, he was surprised theorists are correct, suggests a black swan possibility that things could happen in the at the top or in Russia somewhere, or like coronavirus. <laughs> People right. are, he just cannot control. Unless, he had to have a rasborka. Yeah, he had and to I have think, a little guys, rasborka. Guys, I think there's a tendency to think the system will go on as it has. I think the odds that it will are about ninety percent, but it's not a hundred percent. And we have to keep in mind the kind of messiness of mm-hmm. all that. Mm-hmm. And I'm raising questions. I'm not answering them because I do not. No, have. but you're sparking a couple of things I yeah, want to throw please in go here. Ahead. Well, I mean, you say, I mean, Kad- who is Kadyrov? And does Kadyrov operate by himself? No, he doesn't. Actually. No, he doesn't. Who is Kadyrov's Krisha other than Putin in, in, in Moscow? His Krisha is Viktor Zolotov, Putin's personal bodyguard going back to his time in St. Petersburg and somebody who's very close to untouchable inside of Putin's inner circle. The one person Putin trusts more than anybody, right? The guy who is now at the head of the, the National Guard, Putin's own personal Praetorian Guard. That is Kadyrov's Krisha. Yeah. So I'm assuming Putin, I mean, I'm kind of trying to work out a scenario. I, of course, don't know. But I'm trying to imagine what was going on those two weeks where Putin disappeared from public view and people were wondering if he was dead. And Brian, right? and Brian, yeah. Brian and this, this there dynamic. Were, there were pictures on Twitter of the Lenin mausoleum with Putin in it and stuff. Yeah, I mean, Brian, this, this dynamic crazy between weird. Zolotov and Putin and Kadyrov, well, this was it's what not was at all happening. clear to me. This was what was happening. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I... I, I definitely think what was happening was Putin was trying to get to the bottom of how did this happen and maybe Kadyrov was operating with Zolotov's green light yes and, yes you know he interpreted that as Putin's green light yeah and yeah. is Putin going to throw I know K- we're making we're, 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 <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going, speculating I don't know are, they, are we way off base here uh, I, I, again uh, this is not uh, we cannot we, we don't have scientific discussion we don't about this but uh, what I see is uh, so all these cases are immediately surrounded with lots of disinformation and these different uh, uh, secret telegram channels yes, saying yes, they're telling yes, us different yes, theories right. some of the stuff that you raise sound to me like that like Putin was shocked by this uh, assassination Putin was trying to get to the bottom of who did it. I personally go for the most simple straightforward theory that no one could have killed 
uh, uh, such politician in front of Kremlin without Putin directly I knowing about this. I would say Zakadirov with Zolotov's blessing. Uh, but, <laughs> but again, again, again I yes. Would, I mean, really, I, I mean, I, if it were, you know, Sechin or somebody else acting with that, Kadyrov with Zolotov's blessing, because I think there's one person in Russia Putin's afraid of, and it's Kadyrov. Because without he, there's fear that Chechnya descends into chaos. I mean, I don't think that's true. I think they could find somebody else that can keep Chechnya. Well, well, yeah, my, my point on that systemic lesson of Boris's death is related to this, guys, which is that I don't think it's necessarily the case that this balance always is going to be there. Putin is the balancer. Right. And it's not an easy job, as we've seen. And, and pasmotr, you know, that's, right. all, that's all I'm going to say because it largely will continue, I think, as it has, but we can't be sure. This is an this is an instance where it raises a lot of questions about how things work. I mean, the one thing that makes me think Putin was surprised by this is not any telegram channels, which we all should take with a grain of salt. The two weeks. Um, the two-week disappearance from public. This was a PR nightmare for the Kremlin. It was. It was. This was. It was weird. It made the regime. You think they look would have weak. had it more, more slickly prepared. They did. They had it. They, well, they tried to, but keep, people kept pointing out. Remember, they kept putting these photos out yeah. of Putin meeting people, and it turned out they were like checking the calendars and the clocks. On, you know, there they, they were the internet. Well, didn't did Stalin go go hide for a few right after after, 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 after the Nazi German invasion? Yeah. invasion. He, he did. The former ally. He did. He did. But those were different times then. You didn't yeah. have Twitter then. Does Putin? How do you explain Putin? disappearance after this well you can explain it in my view as he just wanted he didn't want to face journalists and he he uh, doesn't have to do that anyway uh, well like <laughs> and he uh, just uh, wanted to see the reaction he wanted to see how Maybe. this first of march uh, demonstration would go uh, how, what sort of uh, disinformation could be planted he just you know um, he can afford to, he could have uh, he could afford to wait and he mm. did um, I don't think it's proof of anything mm -hmm. um um, it's not a proof to me that he was not behind this, at least. Okay. It's not proof, but it mm. made me think, hmm, this is, this is unusual. Uh, and I, it made me think, it gave credence to that. I don't rule it out. Like I said at the outset, I think I, I, there's one thing I don't doubt, and that is that is Kadyrov's involvement. Um, the one open, the big open question, was he going rogue, which is certainly plausible. It's Kadyrov we're talking about here, right? Or was he acting with Putin's sanction? Um, you mentioned Stalin, and this is the last, well, I mean, we're trying to dig into psychology well, of know, a yeah, crazy guy. Uh, 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 so uh, I studied Stalin um, a little bit and his times, uh, and there is a great book about, uh, uh, you know, art of deception by Stalin. Mm. Um, he, try, he also planted these various theories and disinformation around his actions but uh, then uh, he, he, all, he he very often tried to accuse various parties uh, of things that he actually did himself and when about we know about Putin that he's absolutely paranoid about his security right for, uh, uh, starting from St. Petersburg yes I, I remember he's, he's, he's afraid of being poisoned I mean recently we learned that he goes to uh, uh, global meetings like eating his own food taking his own I'm sorry toilet <laughs> and go, going to body <laughs> with like six bodyguards to, right. to, to bathroom and so forth so um, um, I it's think a this, family show this guy is definitely afraid of assassination right uh, and his his track record shows that he's been involved with many assassinations or benefited from them. Mm. For me, that's uh, kind of the same thing at the, with Stalin. Now we learned that Stalin, you know, has been behind many of these direct mm. orders. Um, obviously, we'll know only in about two or three decades. Uh, yeah, well, this maybe is what, I, this is what I wanted to close out. I mean, with the OSCE's call for a, for a fresh investigation, I'm not holding my breath for one happening in Russia. Um, you know, decades after the Kirov assassination, we basically found out when, in, in pretty good forensic detail who was behind it. How long is it going to take before we can really get a clear picture of this? Um, is it going to be decades? It's already been five years. I would imagine after Putin uh, somehow steps down from power. Uh, th Regardless th th of who th follows? Um, obviously, it, if, if some successor is chosen and manages to stay in power, then probably so not. So when this regime is over. Mm -hmm. is, yes. um, but in, even if it's someone like Khrushchev, uh, you know, uh, uh, compared to Stalin, right. um, he might have, he might see a benefit in revealing uh, this notorious case. If it, yeah, if there's a need to kind of bring yeah. bring that constituency into the into into the new authorities, Don, last thoughts before we we call. Well, it I just a, think it remarkable that we haven't mentioned a single other opposition leader. Go for it. 
I can't. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> this shows a vacuum that Boris left. Well, no, he did leave a vacuum in him at the time. And actually, this is something that's w- worth diving into. I mean, I was wonder. One of the big questions in my mind at the time is no I was looking the word at the Navalny. Well, this is the word I was about to say. Looking at the landscape of the Russian opposition after, and Nemtsov was, let's face it, already in the process of kind of informally passing the torch to Navalny at that time, and he did so very gracefully, I thought, and which again spoke volumes about the man's character is yeah. that he didn't feel crowded out by Nevada. They had political differences and they argued with each other in, in, in advance of the 2011 state Duma elections, if you remember correctly, where Nemtsov was calling for a boycott and Navalny was calling for, like, vote for anybody but United Russia, even if it's the communists or Zhirinovsky, just to deny them a majority. Navalny turned out to be right in that argument. And I don't remember if, if Boris uh, acknowledged that, but he clearly was fine passing the torch to this new generation. After Nemtsov was killed, I was worried, like, what is the future of Navalny? I mean, is he, he's got to think he's got a big old target on his back. And I hope, I hope he's walking around with a lot of security. Um, what, what impact did this have on Navalny and the rest of the, of the opposition, to your knowledge, Julia? You, you're a little closer to this than we are. I think um, the the question of whether to participate in any elections or not is still one of the most divisive in Russian right. opposition. I wonder what would Nimtsov would say about this uh, upcoming referendum right. on 22nd of right. April. He, I guess he would probably say don't boycott, just yeah. boycott it. Yeah. But um, now it remains, I mean, Navalny is not giving himself a, a, a proper answer to this. I he mean, not yet. He hasn't formulated. But do you think um, the killing of Nemtsov basically, ca- did it have an effect on Navalny, Ilya well, Yashin, well, definitely the many others. people in... united somehow to to some extent behind Navalny. He yeah. became the new leader. I mean, Yashin Milov, um, Karamurza is uh, not really in his circle, but he's, he's not the against minister. him. He's the foreign minister. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so there there was, as I said, some sort of uh, at least broad unification of uh, Russian opposition forces. But at the same time. Um, uh, the question remains, uh, the, I mean, for me, the main question really is Russians are not ready to take to streets uh, en masse. So uh, uh, I, I personally, uh, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to propose that, you know, Russians should look for peaceful, nonviolent, you know, um, ways to sp- but be public about mm-hmm. it. Uh, this is not yet taking any, uh, th- 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 there needs to be a long process of development of conscien- consciousness, con- consciousness yeah. in Russian opposition and new methods. Um, and I, I, Boris Nemtsov would have been a great figure to, to do that. Mm. Uh, so now, um, really, uh, Navalny, I don't know, he's building this network of young supporters, and this is great. But I think Russian opposition still needs to, to do much more. And he's uh, carrying on, in a way, Boris's tradition with his investi- with Navalny's investigations. Now, he's been, he's, he's been doing it for a long time, too. But again, this is kind of this tradition that I think Nemtsov basically started with the Putin Itogi report, right? Exactly, if, if, yes. I'm trying to remember what year that came out. To, to, uh, the, the, the biggest one was 2008, but there was some, some other... So that was before report. Navalny was doing his anti-corruption. I mean, not that, not that one was following the other, but it is this tradition that I think Nemtsov started this kind of research into corruption and making it public in a really slick way. Navalny's taken it to a new level with his videos, um, which are really entertaining and really digestible and and, 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 and go viral for that reason. Um, so that so, but yeah, you'd, I would I would uh, agree that that's uh, that that's another another big legacy. Don, any any last thoughts uh, from either of you? Improve my, uh, my mood a little bit, but I'm fine. I've kind of I kept the I kept the discussion loose today to keep it because I knew we all had a lot to say. I didn't want to structure it too tightly, but I thought this was a, a good a good uh, way I to agree. honor our, our our friend five years after his passing. But Ilya always brings the uh, the portrait from the, the country yeah. itself. So, and uh, yeah, rest in peace. Well, we miss him. And rest in yeah. peace, and we won't forget. No, no, we won't. All right. Well, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. I would like to remind you, you have been listening to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. Joining me here in the studio has been former U.S. State Department official and veteran Kremlin watcher Donald Jensen, a senior fellow and editor in chief here at SEPA and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. Also with us in the studio has been Ilya Zaslavsky, the head of research at the Free Russia Foundation. Thank you both for an enlightening discussion. A pleasure. Thank you. (laughs) Always a pleasure. Also like to thank our producer, 
Dermot Hall Harmata for keeping the lights on and all the complicated machines well oiled and in working order throughout our discussion. I'd also like to remind you, you could subscribe to the Power Vertical podcast on iTunes. You could read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at SEPA.org. And you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. Join us again next week when it will be my birthday. And now, as always, I leave you with something other than the ambient sounds of my favorite socially conscious Russian rapper, Noise MC. 